Hello, everybody. Good evening and welcome to New York Live Arts. I was just wondering where I was. New York Live Arts and the second of the Bill series, Bill Chat series. The third one is going to be in March, uh, next decade, can you believe that? Uh, with Marlon James. So uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that this event and, in fact, every event takes place in Lenape Hoking, the ancestral homelands of the Lenape people. And we like to honor the land, the waters, the people, past, present, and coming in the future. So we are very honored and delighted to have Elizabeth Diller, artist, world-renowned architect, director, educator, visionary, uh, to be our, our speaker today with Bill. And, uh, Bill T. Jones, artistic director of this place and the Bill T. Jones Anisane Company, invited Liz to collaborate on our, the company's next project, Deep Blue Sea, uh, which will premiere next April at the Armory. And luckily for us, Liz said yes. So, um, and speaking of the company's new work, I would just like to uh, thank our partners in creation, <laughs> led by the amazing and one and only Ellie Friedman, I'm embarrassing her, um, and Partners in Creation provides funding and support for the company's new works. And Ellie is like a friend, and I always say, um, when I grow up, I want to be like her. Small and Jewish, no. <laughs> kind, <laughs> generous, intelligent, <laughs> all the rest. And small. <laughs> anyway, so I think tonight's uh, conversation is going to be about two artists coming together from very different and maybe sometimes intersecting uh, interests, backgrounds, disciplines, so on and so forth. And maybe they will even forget that we're here at some point and just go into one of those deep artistic discussions and then bring us back for the Q&A. So anyway, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Diller and Bill T. Jones. Hey, Liz. Hey, how are you? It's not like we get enough of each other, you know. We have, and she was so kind to, to do this. And this woman is much in demand, so we really are very moved that you do this conversation. Um, I, I'll just start by saying that um, the company worked for six years on a work which was called Analogy, which was based on three oral histories. My mother-in-law, Dora Amelon, a Jewish woman from World War II. My nephew, um, a young dancer, um, a young man who was caught up in the escort business. Uh, and then the third one was based on a quasi um, fictitious character. Uh, I love the works. Uh, it really pulled every bit of chops I had about text and so on. It was over, and I was thinking, you know, what the hell, why make another work? I don't want to make another work. And then, I believe this is the way it happened, uh, the new director of the Armory said, we'd like to offer you a commission. Oh, <laughs> you, know, you know how artists are. Uh, so I, and um, I began to think, putting one and one, to, well, what about inviting, I could have, work with anybody I would like to. Hey, Melissa, hello, honey. Um, and uh, Liz Diller. So it was enough, just the opportunity to work in that huge room and to work with an artist of this caliber and Peter Negrini, wonderful videographer, um, I was suddenly excited again about making a work. So, and a lot of that had to do with working with a person who I've always, I've only known you through your work, uh, but I've always respected you. And the fact that when we did first meet, you said to me, uh, well, you don't do decor. <laughs> I don't do decor. Uh, so, we uh, jumped into this, and that's how, that's how the project started. Uh, how do you remember it happening? Uh, let's see. I, I think we were um, talking about, well, we had met um, many years ago. Um, Cooper Union, right? At Cooper Union mm -hmm. with Rick Scofidio, who's my partner sitting in the front row mm -hmm. in life and in work. 
Um, and we had all met, and then there was a big pause, and we um, started to talk about My Long Opera, and we wanted to talk yes. about, mm -hmm. you know, what it could be like um, working together on this sort of crazy thing that we were imagining. Um, but we didn't know whether there was a role for choreography and what was really, yeah. you know, what was... Mm -hmm. Um, we, Did we anyone had an see idea. My Long Opera by any chance? Yeah, yeah it's good. fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, so, so we had this um, idea about doing something uh, with a community of um, singers. The David Lang was the uh, composer, and we wanted to do something about change um, in New York. And 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 Bill and I started to talk about this. And, and anyway, that's when we started up a conversation. And I think that. Conver uh, then we sort of got into the next notch of knowing each, each other. Mm -hmm. And so then, when um, somehow this invitation came, when you um, asked, it was, it was for, for me and Rick also, it was like a two-pronged thing. One was to work with you, which also, um, you know, we have been uh, fans of your work. Never imagined we would work together. Um, and um, and working at the Armory too was sort of for an architect. It's uh, it's like, oh my God, you know, how do we handle a space that big? And so it's a great it's a great challenge. And uh, Rebecca, Rebecca Robertson, um, who uh, invited the commission, right, mm -hmm. um, is an old friend of ours from Lincoln Center. We did all that work at Lincoln Center, and she was in charge of the redevelopment. So there was a big loop. Um, I think that the when you sort of when we had our first conversation, you put on the table this a Melville chapter and character, and maybe mm -hmm. you want to describe that because that's that was the hook. It was yes. that, and yeah, you should you should so say something about it. So it's probably important to to give that. So you've been your response to it and your response to the space at the armory is is precious. Right. Um, for those of you who. Uh, have not read Moby Dick, have not read it recently. As you know, there is a character um, who is a, kind of a cabin boy janitor, and his name is Pip, P-I-P. Um, and uh, Melville uh, starts off this chapter 93 describing there is a black one and there's a white one. Uh, the, the white one he describes, as, am I making this up somewhat dough-like? Uh, pleasant, but a little slow. And then there's a black run. The, the little black was brilliant. So Pip is, uh, he plays a mean tambourine, uh, so much so that whenever the sailors want to have a party, they call on Pip to make the music. It really, sometimes it pisses him off. He doesn't like that. Um, and uh, long and the short of it, he's about 11 years old, never has been a slave. He comes from Connecticut, I believe. And he's on this ship with these crazy people, and he finds himself placed in the uh, harpooner's boat. And if you know anything about the whaling industry, it was a bro boat that probably held about 12 people. Uh, there would be the harpooners who just happened to end in Melville's Moby Dick to be all men of color. Um, there's a, a man from Tahiti, there's a Native American man, there's an, an a, a North African man, and they all have the job of spearing the whale, and they're quite beautiful. It's a beautiful um, description of them. Uh, but Pip is put in there unprepared into the boat, and he shouldn't be there. He's afraid the, a whale, not Moby, a whale goes underneath the boat, hits the bottom of it, thumps the boat. He gets so frightened, he jumps into the water, gets tangled into the ropes, and they have to decide to uh, leave him there to drown or cut him loose and lose the whale. And this is, man is a money-making animal, which too often dims his brightness, says Melville. Uh, so that's one time. But uh, Mr. Stubb, the famous Mr. Stubb, said, uh, cut him loose. Let the young guy, little guy go, but he gives him a stern warning. Stay in the boat, Pip. Stay in the goddamn boat, because next time we will leave you. We can get a lot more money on the market selling the whale than we could selling you. Well, nice, huh? Uh, two weeks go by. I think about two weeks, and some reason he's back once again in this boat. The whale goes underneath, thumps the boat, he jumps in the water, and but this time, before they even have a chance to decide if they're going to leave him or not, they spot a school of whales, and all the boats leave. 
and he is now bobbing left. Uh, how does Melville say? Uh, like a head of cloves. You all know what a cloves looks like? Uh, bobbing up in the ocean, nappy head, right? And the boats, uh, there's a one mile horizon defined by the boats, a uh, two mile horizon, a three mile horizon, shortly four, and then all the boats are gone. Now, and it's middle of the day, thank God it's the middle of the day, in the sun-kissed Pacific Ocean, and he's bobbing up and down. And we, the reader, don't know. Did they lead him on purpose? And what do you do when you're water like that? And Melville says that even seasoned sailors, when they're out in the open sea and they want to take a dip, they don't dare move too far away from the boat because it's just too frightening, too desolate, too lonely. And um, he is about, uh, bobbing there. And he says, uh, Melville says, the, the ocean jeeringly kept his finite body up, but drowned the infinite of his soul. And his soul went down, 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 and he meets the miser man wisdom who shows in the hoarded heaps, and the celestial orbs go in front of his eyes. And then he sees God's foot on the treadle of the universe. And from that day forward, he saw God's truth and he spoke it. So his boatmates called him mad. Man's insanity is God's sense. Now, so that's where my whole feeling about the piece came from. Of course, I meet this lady, and she says, ah, infinity, ocean, I, the, the army's not big enough, she <laughs> said. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> to, to <laughs> present it. Well, okay, um, but, you know, th that first meeting with, um, so there's a world of references to start a piece from, right, if mm -hmm. one wants to start one. To start a reference, you know, to start a piece um, with this classic novel that we're all supposed to read in high school, right? Oh, should we About do a little non-scientific? Who has read Moby Dick? Yeah, I mean, we all, right? So Well-educated audience, right. yes. Okay, and the question is, does anybody remember this character, Pip? You do. One There's hand. one person. One, two hands. Okay, wow. Okay, so there are a couple. Um, but what, what got me so excited about this was to, <laughs> to take on this sort of canonical piece of literature, you know, okay, but it's not really about Ahab, it's not about the whale, it's not about, you know, all the, the lofty ideas, it's about this seemingly inconsequential character that barely anyone remembers whose life was expendable and um, who could be left to drown for the whatever, because man is a whatever, a monitor, money making animal. Mo money -making animal. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I th thought that that was such a powerful sort of reference. Um, and the timing and of the, and please. Yeah, no, no, especially because this was in this, this, this piece of literature that everybody knows, yes. but everyone has overlooked. Like right. that, the meaning and in the importance, and now to read that novel again and you know, to sort of stop there and think mm -hmm. about what that meant, what could, what could that have meant right. to Melville, um, and to sort of use that as a launching point mm -hmm. for a new piece, um, I thought was, you know, like that was the center of the, of the, of the conversation for a long time, and we yes, moved way beyond in different directions. But the equation with that lone body, this sort of notion of loneliness, and, and Bill, you were also talking about your own loneliness mm -hmm. in a kind of sea of other thing, artists and New York and, and so forth. There was something about the individual um, a sort of, um, and, and, and being alone, even in a crowd. And we mm -hmm. started to talk about that aloud. Uh, you know, with each other uh, o over time, and and the notion of that, the image, that searing image of that that body in the ocean and the vastness. How could we share that with the audience? And when so coming back to your, you know, the very first thing you said that you know I, we don't make s sort of scenery or mm -hmm. you know we don't do decoration or whatever, like in 
in architecture, yeah, we don't think of it as um, you know decorative or anything. We uh, decor, 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 mm -hmm. and in theater or dance or uh, you know we we don't think we think of environments we make an environment that you know is filled with sound and it's you know combined with staging and it's what you see and and that sort of immersive feeling that you want the audience to have and that's what we're interested in so you know when we starting with the notion of vastness loneliness um, and the armory it was such a natural to imagine sharing the vastness of that space with the audience, but going beyond it and thinking that it wasn't big enough somehow to represent vastness. And we didn't know whether we were going to try to represent it uh, literally or, you know. Well, remember originally we thought that there was a component, and I don't know what happened to that uh, from the mandate from the armory, but that it should be able to be open during the day. Oh, yeah and that the public should be able to come into an art ins installation during the day. Right. So that's, that made me even more confident that you were the collaborator for us, because you could make an interesting space, and people could come that, that, back that evening and see it theatricalized. Yeah. Now, in right. here, it's an important point in the conversation, because uh, we have, yes, Liz has, has eloquently talked about the qualities, what shall I call them, the elemental formal qualities of the space and this, even an idea like loneliness and so on. Um, but the part that was already in place that I don't know, did I tell you about um, um, I Have a Dream in Retrograde from the very beginning? That was floating around. Yes. Yeah. And you know, it was actually more than floating. Yeah. It was there almost before yeah. Pip. Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, anybody who knows my work, you know that going back to Uncle Tom's Cabin and even earlier back in Binghamton when I was thinking about making a work called I Am Not Sidney Poitier, um, <laughs> you, know, you, you chuckle, huh? <laughs> yes, it's, it is a little funny, painful funny, but there was a time when if you were a, a black guy, you were either um, Malcolm X or Martin Luther King guy. And then if you were not in either of those, you had to be presentable enough to be able to do Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. <laughs> and uh, I'm now I, um, and this is where we, I'm doing racial looking tonight, and my brothers in the room know what I mean by, have you ever been in a situation where someone says, they turn to you and say, uh, excuse me, you have a knife? Happens, right? Why are you asking me if I have a knife? <laughs> but but we're all woke now about you know what I'm talking about. I don't I don't need to wake you up about what that means. So Martin Luther King backwards is sacrilege. Lasted free, lasted free, almighty God thank lasted free, spiritual negro old and the and sing. Uh, uh, Free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last, in the words of the old Negro spiritual. Um, the, the, it's a, it is so common, so much a part of our experience, that I had, since the early, late 70s, wanted to turn it around to do violence to it so that you would care about it again, so that I would care about it. But care about what? And that was the question, particularly when this piece was being conceived in the time of Black Lives Matter. And we'll get later to the fact to, if you accept that there's something in the air about rethinking uh, black America as Pip, rethinking Bill T. Jones is not downtown uh, artist, but actually black man in white avant-garde and then if you think about all the things that we were told we don't do in the avant-garde, we don't entertain, we don't titillate, we don't pander, we're pure. And we so pure by whose estimation? You don't wiggle your hips and you don't talk about the fact that usually, just like in this room right now, you can count the black people on one hand and it's full of room full of good white liberals. Bless them. I love them. But that was what was going on 
when Melville came into the picture, I felt lonely. I had felt lonely, I realized, my whole career I'd felt lonely. Even with Arnie Zane, I felt lonely. And I loved him dearly. But it was different. Then we now have permission for me to actually say, by the way, I love you, but we're different. And then Deep Blue Sea begins to, yes, there is Melville. Yes, there is infinity. But the little black bobbing in the water can be a lot of different things. And once you accept the little black bobbing in the water, what about the trans person that says every time they come into any room, they feel like they have to go through a whole, um, it's not easy to be a trans person. We don't have the words to describe, we don't have the pronouns, the bathrooms, everything. Uh, I don't know, I have, a, I have a trans performer in the company and I'm still tripping over their pronouns. So, and what about the, the glass ceiling for women? And what about, there's a lot of pips. And what's more, we live in an era right now where people can say, I'm angry as hell and I'm not gonna let you forget it. Fractious conversation. So, Bill T, Martin Luther King, Pip, my company, which has been this mini raft that has sustained me. And then, well, let's just try this thing and open it up to the whole world. Can we get 100 people of varied descriptions and let them have a go at it and even give them a, micro, a microphone at some point and tell me, tell the audience, what do you re really know? I know. That is the money shot of the piece. Is it a picture of democracy? Is it the opposite of loneliness? And the piece is not kumbaya at the end, which would be nice, wouldn't it? People may like it better if it was. We all come together. But we ain't together. Can I, I want to say one thing along the way here. So, so, the, so starting with the lonely single um, person, right, that is, and the other thing that I got so sort of seduced by to be involved in this thing was that it was inevitably about Bill. This piece was about Bill. And he needed to, at this moment in his career, he wanted to do a piece it was very meaningful him. Um, you know, the, the, the context, the ethos, the, the, the um, sort of the references, they were your references. There was something very autobiographical, even though whenever we talk about it, you don't want to say you deny that, but um, because it relates to, it's personal, okay. But that's what's so compelling about it, right? And, um, just you know, a word about that sort of that single person that is Bill. That is, we 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 the the piece, and you know, it's no maybe no surprise later, but we we we're in a uh, a, a beautiful old drill hall with one man, you know, solo um, at the beginning. This Martin Luther King um, sort of backwards thing is is part of Bill's work and. How do, we, how do we connect the dots on all of these references of Bill's? Um, it has been a question, continues to be as we work the piece through. But that single solo um, person, and there was a kind of always play between abstraction and um, uh, sort of political content. And how far can dance go? You know, what are we saying? How many words can we put into this? How much is it sort of the physical, dealing with a body physically in space? Do we need words? Do we need spoken words? Do we need projected, projected words? How many references and so forth? So this has been an ongoing, really, really interesting um, evolution of a piece. We didn't know exactly where it was going as it was moving, but um, the single person to the company, right? The single bill to the company, and then to this 
100, right? So there is a mathematical, when Bill posed it, he said, I want to go from 1 to 10, you know, I want to, I want to multiply one by ten. I want to multiply ten by you know by ten. It, it, it's a math, mathematical abstract thing, you know. But it, as it turns out, it's not really you know. Yes, there's um, simple math, but it's something much more about this um, you know this sense of the company as the first sort of home, the and then the growth and this. You know, we are all the audience among the hundred, among the one, among the ten. So there's something uh, that's very rich in there. But the politics were sort of always there. And the sort of formal formation of the piece was also always there. And it's a, it was a, a very, very interesting sort of evolution to turn. You know, how could we bring this politically charged piece that's full of emotive things, you know, to the audience as a shared experience, um, still, you know, and with movement and all the things that you do, I mean, it's your life's work, um, but, you know, how do we get all this across? And how many words do we need? Yes, yes. And, and there's something about this where it is about Bill, which I, I, you're right, it is, but you understand that that's a trap. Because when you're the only one when you are a token, you are shut down because why are you complaining? You're in here with us. Why, 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 are you, why are you complaining? You're not like them. So that's why you always felt me pushing back and saying it's about Bill. Not to mention that I took for many, many years, I was considered, and it's probably right, self-involved, narcissistic, you know, well, these, this, is, this is what it means to look like I look, to be a moving body, right? And to try to say I on stage. But, you know, I mean... But, no, just for a moment. To say I is the saying I'm not an invisible man. Hmm. And then when you say I, well, what's your problem? Why, why do we have to deal with who you are? You're such an egotist. Mm -hmm. I say, but I'm a different egotist. Yeah. Because you need to have my voice in this room. We know that now, right? We're woke now. We know why people say, I'm a black woman now. And we are, or we're just going through a period, we're just tolerating this, you know? Right, but, but you know, when I say um, that it's a piece about you, I don't mean it's a piece, it's a piece about uh, Bill T. Jones, the artist. I mean, it's a it's a piece about a black man's sort of um, through a, through the lens of a black artist. Um, it's a piece about um, the issues that are really you know sort of emotionally sensitive that deal with moments in history, um, you know, especially across the twentieth century that we can, and especially across your life, and those are not just autobiographical moments. They're moments in which we are able to sort of understand that Martin Luther King's speech, you know, we all sort of can remember, you know, those of us are, they're old enough, remember, you know, where that is, what that is. And um, so it's not about you speaking, it's about you're speaking on behalf of, you know, the intersection between all of our lives and those important moments in time. And when you talk about sort of more contemporary references, we also understand them because they're pop references. And I won't give it away, but there's something sort of very, very rich about a pop reference that we all sort of understand, but from a very, very particular perspective that the audience that's going to come to this piece is, is going to be less familiar with, and they're going to pick up something very, very rich in this. Now and you realize, of course, that there's, there's a problem, not a, not a problem, uh, there's an ancillary work we were making called uh, What Problem? Uh, Janet, do you have uh, the, the boys quote? Yes, I would like it. Uh, this notion of a problem, right, is important. Um, what does it feel like to be a problem? Yes, W.E.B. Du Bois quote. 
Herein lie buried many things which, if read with patience, may show the strange meaning of being black here in the dawning of the 20th century. This meaning is not without interest to you, gentle reader, for the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, the relation of the darker to the lighter races of men in Asia and Africa, in America and the islands of the sea, and yet being a problem is a strange experience peculiar even for one who has never been anything else, save perhaps in babyhood and in Europe. And how does Nick write? What does it feel to be a problem? That's, one of, that's, a, that's a, a, a develop, something we're developing right now. Anybody in this room feel like a problem? I see a couple of hands, yeah. Come on, anybody else feel like a problem? Mm hmm. Yes, yes. You push back against people who want to push you in the corner, you're saying. So you refuse to be a problem. Yes, right, right. And I think the thing right now, the pirouette, I think the fierce motherfuckers is what, you know, hey, I don't have a problem. You got a problem, right? Gay people don't have a problem. You have a problem. Women don't have a problem. Men have a problem. Black people don't have a problem. White people have a problem. And yet, you're a problem. So this is what Liz and I are trying to find a way. How can we, um, how do we make this work? Because I, it could be a work that was only Bill walking a la Lucinda Childs, or some minimal expression, walking in that big space. That's been done. And let the, let the chips fall where they may. Why are you chanting this thing backwards? Why many, how many words do you need? Obviously, we need, it's not enough just to do the walking. And then why do you want, why in the last section don't you have 100 black men. Why are there people that l look like this room? Why did you do that? Well, that's the world I live in. And that's the one I stay committed to, and it's hard as hell. Today, my sister, who is pretty fierce, our <laughs> birthday, her birthday. Anybody see the film uh, Queen and Slim? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, they had to like, uh, Bjorn had to peel me off the seat last night when it was over. Yeah, have you seen it? No, I want to see it so bad. You're going with your mom? Yes, I am. Yes, yes. Do you have any other buddies to go with? No, I have a lot. Well, yeah, okay. it's, it's, it's kind of, it's tough. It's very tough. And quite frankly, I'm not even sure if it's healthy for me. Because as I get older, I get more full of resentment and anger, more crusty, you know? And that film, at the center of it is the question, is cop killing ever allowed? I don't want to answer such a question. So what does it feel like to be a problem? We're trying to make a piece that is trying to take it past Bill, even past Martin Luther King, and we're talking about the moment that we're living in right now and we're all decent people, right? We want to live. We want to be, we want to be able to love each other. What's the problem? Now, let's do it with aesthetics. Uh, Can we do it with aesthetics? Well, you know, I, I think I really disappointed Bill when I said, well, the space doesn't need anything. <laughs> It should just be left empty, and I think you thought I was going to make all sorts of like <laughs> doodads, you know, or, um, and so um, you know that yeah. So we're using a very very minimal palette of projection, um, and that projection sometimes delivers um, words, and sometimes it delivers um, sort of texture and um, uh, sort of spatial references, um, and that that uh, uh, that projection is uh, the dimension of the stage um, with the audience surround. 
Um, and um, it also is a kind of um, uh, protagonist or it's a member of the choreographic group. The space itself. The space itself mm -hmm. and the projection and the words and mm -hmm. the way that they sort of spatialize and, and, uh, and work with the choreography. So um, I, the, the um, sort of aesthetic uh, of it is, um, is just simply one of doing a lot with the least amount of stuff. There are some, um, I, I don't want to give it away, but there's there's one sort of element that that does something with the space that um, that that sort of increases the space. But um, I think generally speaking, it's about um, immersion. It's about seeing that um, single um, human that's walking from the way over there and they're that small and they get bigger and bigger and bigger as they get closer to you and then they move away and so forth. So there's um, this sense of um, the, the scale of that space and really working with it, not being afraid of it. Um, uh, and, you know, as more um, of the... Which is a lot, isn't it? It's, it's a lot. It's a lot yeah. already. Yeah, it's yeah. a lot. I yeah. mean, just to put one single oh. figure illuminated on in that in a surface that's sort of surrounded by a couple of rings of seats it it's it means you know it I mean, your attention is like totally fixed to that point in space and um and, and you I know and I, I think you're absolutely right but i'm looking at any person in this room could be given that part mm -hmm. right and it would that would happen like uh this lady right here right a, a woman walking on a figure eight in a huge room, right? But you know, I don't think that I am just any person. Now, and I, that's not about patting me on the back, but I have a crude meaning in the culture, right? I have a crude meaning. And um, therefore, it is not a just any man walking on stage. And this person on stage comes with all that baggage, so the walking, yes, it is about that individual, that existential thing, but there's also why this guy, knowing what we know about him, and he's very been very public about very personal things, and he's been identified with a lot of very personal things and strong, divisive things. Now, it, there are a lot of people who don't know who the hell I am, but a lot will know, and they will find out by somebody who's sitting next to them who will say that. So therefore, already it comes loaded. It, and, and it isn't, um, like I say, any individual could be doing the walking, but no. And what's more, the guy walking it is the guy who had the idea to walk it. Because you can find a lot of situations in our culture right now where somebody has an idea and you put a person out there in it, particularly a black body. If you want to be contemporary right now, a black female body, our kind of, that's how we stay up with the times, right? Because that's how the levers are pulled. But what about somebody who really has said, my agency is one of the elements of the, pro, of the poetry I'm making here tonight. My agency. Well, what do you mean? We know you have agency. Oh, no, 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 you don't know that I have agency. And how many of them are there in the world? How many of them are in this city right now? Where is my generation? There's one. There's Stephen. There's Susan Marshall. There's what? How many Bill T. Joneses are there? Why is that? Why is there only one Alvin Ailey? Why? What is that? What, 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 what happened? So when you look at this guy, and I, I'm going out on a limb and saying this, sounding like an asshole. I was, a woman came up to my house some years ago. She came up with um, Terrence McKnight this beautiful voice from uh, FM radio, and he and I were making a new friendship, and she came, very attractive young black woman, and I didn't know, oh, great, 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 and as we, she's enjoying the dinner that my husband Bjorn has made, and so on, and then she said, well, you know, we're, I'm at uh, 651 in Brooklyn, a space I've never been to. It was 
a black space of the 90s, right? And she said, you know, we'd like to invite you to participate in something. We're going to pick a personality and we're going to we're going to uh, do a whole curation around this one personality. And uh, I said, well, who's it going to be? Well, we'd like it to be about you. What? Well, oh, suddenly I am the stuff out of which you write new papers about. Well, what do you mean? And these are young black artists are going to be sitting and discussing me. Whoa. What? You mean I'm not a part of you? I am exhibit A? Yes, you are. Quite frankly, you are. How do you feel about that? I was sort of angry. I was scared. What have you? I, ref I didn't do it. What was that about? You are exhibit A. We can talk about you. And I'm not Tony. I'm not Tony Morrison. I'm not Maya. I'm not, I am alive right now. Well, what is there about me? Because you are controversial. What do you mean I'm controversial? I even had someone tell me, you are, this is a word they used to use, with, um, uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, you know, she's polarizing. Bill, you're polarizing. What does that mean to be polarizing? That's the sort of thing people don't say to you. They say about you. Anyways, that's the person who is walking and talking about free at last, free at last. Yeah. So, so um, the sort of the sort of interesting phenomenon about stepping into uh, a, a performance space, right at um, before the beginning of the, of the piece, like, right, pre-curtain, is that the audience shares the space in a very sort of normal, everyday way, like citizens of the city, you know, coming in under house lights and so forth. And there's something extremely sort of fantastic about that. I've always imagined, you know, and Rick and I, when we worked on Alice Tully Hall at Lincoln Center for the first time. It was the first time we worked in a theater as, you know, as architects making a new sort of concert hall out of an old one. Um, and we thought about that moment of transition from being sort of normal, you know, every, everybody into an audience. There's a moment that we sort of lose ourselves to being part of a group phenomenon, which is an audience and putting all attention on the performer on the stage or however you know the setup is. And what is that transition from house lights to theater lights? From the hush of the crowd to the moment the first you know, thing is heard that is coming from the stage. And that moment is really, really magical for me. You know, and it, 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 it has been. And it's, you know, at the Met when those chandeliers go up, you know, and it's the, um, but, but very few theatrical experiences really celebrate that moment of pre-theatrical to theatrical moment. So in our piece, we stretch that moment out for quite a long time. And it's, you know, it's... Right, so, but you are, Bill, walking around in this configuration when the audience is just starting to take their seats. And we're under house lights. And we may notice you, we may not notice you. The moment we notice you, we'll, oh, this is the guy, this is the choreographer, he's down there. Well, okay, we sort of pay attention to this, but we're still sort of, getting to our seats and taking our coats and, you know, talking to our neighbor and, um, because the signals of theatricality still haven't set in, even though there's a performer there. So slowly, um, and this is just around this sort of stretched out transition, um, there is a slight change in the mood of the lighting, slightly, just ever so slightly, where you may or may not notice that the attention is, is starting to move to the stage. The audience is still, you know, it's hard to get an audience to stop talking before they're an audience, right? When they're just singular people that have filed in. You need the cue. It's usually the curtain that 
that opens, right? Uh, or the uh, music that starts, or something is that, you know, where you pay attention, but, and as an architect, we think of it also as an attribute of the space of the architecture, not just the first word that's spoken. So in this extremely long transition, there is a change of light, and then we start to, you hear your voice, I believe initially unamplified, I think, we're talking about whether it gradually gets amplified or, and how that sort of distinctiveness of that, um, that body that's in the space, sharing that space with us under house lights, transitions to a theatrical body, right? With these words that now all of a sudden have this stronger and stronger meaning because our attention is all on you as an audience. And I think, you know, that's, you know, from an architectural standpoint, that's very meaningful to, uh, it's the beginning of the piece, but it's... Um, so why do you, what are we, yeah, I, it's very beautiful to hear you say it and I hope we can earn what you're saying. <laughs> but now why is that the beginning? What is the um, promise of that? So it's, it's not necessarily, like what do we call a beginning anyway, mm -hmm. right? So in conventional theater we call a beginning, you know, when the curtain opens. Um, and, you know, the cue for the, for the orchestra or the cue for the first actor here, What's very strong about this, um, s the staging of this piece is that, is that it starts um, in an immersive situation that you don't uh, think of as uh, theatrical. Um, you think of it as maybe civic, you know, urban, you know, but you don't think of it as theatrical. And it's that sort of transformation of your attention into a certain mode. And I think that part of the beauty of the kinds of things that we've been talking about, I mean, this may seem sort of very simple, you know, in, in explaining this, but um, when this sort of, you know, this, this, this attention, the um, sort of focusing of attention of an audience um, through the piece to, um, to all the way to the other end, when there's an ending, you know, and then there's that, moment of applause, you know, we're struggling exactly with how, you know, how does this piece end? Does it end like the beginning? Is it soft? Is it, you know, is it transitional to this is there, is urban there an space? Is there an yeah, is there an epiphany? Is there, you mm -hmm. know, a climax? And then, you know, boom, there's a, there's a hard end. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, there's a kind of interesting symmetry potentially there around just drifting, but, uh, you know, because we're in a space with a hundred individuals on stage. And, you know, there are many hundreds of people around those hundred that they're, mm -hmm. ultimately, they leave out of the same doors, you know, and so there's something about the other end uh, that's also sort of very interesting. And, and, and one really notices as an audience member your sort of position as an audience. I think it's, mm -hmm. you know, also maybe a bit of a modernist trope as well. Like mm -hmm. you, you know, you don't take anything for granted. You just, you know, it's, you can t take the whole thing apart, decompose the whole event. Um, and, you know, there are points in the piece where um, the sort of real time, real space is lost and we're in this sort of, I wouldn't say fiction, but it's a space that's transported by sort of the feeling of what the, um, the projection can do. And then other parts that are still, you know, we hear performers breathing and we hear them and they're holding mics and they're saying things mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. into mics themselves, which is unusual for dancers to do. Mm -hmm. There's this whole choreography part, by the way. Right, yes, 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 the whole <laughs> Which is all choreographed. I mean, you know, um, a couple of things, Liz. You know, originally, uh, not originally, but in our downtown world, it became a favorite trope for the audience to already walk into a room where something is happening. Yeah. It's, it, we've all seen it, and it's something that, so, and I know that. Now, what I thought when I first discovered this Epit Mass Mocha was the audience had to like walk through the space and I'm walking in. As a matter of fact, a lady nudged me out of the way because she was trying to get to her seat. And then I heard her, her husband say, you know, that was, that's the guy. 
Where? Where? Like that. And you know, I'm wondering what you're saying, if you really want to undercut it, maybe they should come through the space to get across there. Yeah. You know, they all have dog shit or whatever they got on their feet, but I think we can deal with it. You know, <laughs> that, but maybe that's it. Maybe they should literally, we shouldn't separate that whole thing about this sacred thing going on here and them taking their seats. Right. They're going to get to their seats, where they, and they don't even really understand what they're walking into until they're at their seats, and they're, what's going on here? Oh, why does he keep moving? Oh, that was part of it, and I've just been part of it. Yeah. And I, I, I think that might be yeah. an interesting that, that makes, thing. That makes total sense. I wonder if um, we might, uh, if you would like to join us in this, if there's anything you'd like to, uh, to add. I think we have um, microphones. Yes. Hey. So anyway, um, you make me think as you're describing all of this, um, I spent between Manhattan and Las Vegas, and I've seen every Cirque show many, many times. I was in the media for a long time, and uh, I've seen every incarnation of all of them, and it makes me think when you talk about the singular person on the stage, I think of, oh, because you have this vast stage and there's all this beautiful lighting and there's water and all this, but all you see initially, and of course there have been like clowns in the audience previously, you know, like knocking popcorn out of people's hands and doing all kinds of crazy things. So that's part of the like before, and all the Cirque shows are like that anyway, I'm sure you all know. But um, in, oh, it's just a little baby. It's a guy, you know, Montreal, gymnast, dressed as a teeny baby, and the baby is making little baby sounds that are echoing through the theater and just going from place to place and, you know, seeing all the kinds of things and ooh and ah, you know, it's like it's very interesting that way and it's very immersive mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it really gets people sort of hooked and there's no curtains there, so it's not as if the curtain rises. I mean, you can tell with the music and so forth, other triggers, you know, what starts mm -hmm, the performance, mm -hmm. but it's just very interesting. It made me think of that when you were describing that. Well, one thing I think that, that Liz has done brilliantly, Liz and Peter and Liz's team, is that uh, the stage is very undressed at first. I mean, I imagine it's a gorgeous spot. Mm -hmm. And even though it's, quote, not started yet, I'm sure the lighting is very well considered and so on. But I would like it to feel very raw and very casual when it first starts. And then what Liz is describing is, over time, you don't know that you go into a crafted state. The lights, we now have very sophisticated lighting grid. There's video and so on and so forth. But it, it doesn't want to, uh, and, and you know, and this is something perverse. I don't really want you to be comfortable ever. But I don't know how to do that without uh, betraying myself. I, it, it should not be so easy for it to start and for it to end. And we have a lot of wonderful experiments in this space. There was a group of, where were they from, Janet, those guys that were doing it uh, some years back? I think they were from uh, Austria, Northern Italy, or someplace like that, and they do a kind of folk dance. It ain't really folk dance, but it's like one of those kind of yodel things, these groups, and, they, and it goes on, and they say in the program, we're gonna keep going until everyone in the audience has left or until we're exhausted and we can't go on. And they did. So uh, that's what I mean. At first it seems affable, but they really push something. And this has to do with the bill walking, the way the stage goes from being just a big open drill hall with these to all of permutations, where it goes to, and for me, what is said in the space, and what is said imperfectly, um, and then it has to come to some place, and of course, being the son of a Southern Baptist, I would like it to feel like some place that is like praying. But don't we all want things to feel like that in art? We want it to be so complete so moving, no matter how abstract it is, that we feel we've been transported to some place. That's what I like. I thank you very much for that, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, Suzanne. Hi. Um, I'm going to say this as the great, 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 great granddaughter of a cabin boy 
who threw himself out of his family in Liverpool to cross the world uh, to San Francisco and then around the world and back to Boston and into the arms of the woman who helped found our family. So I'll say that first. And there was something, uh, since of course I haven't seen what you've done lately, but what I remember from the Armory show that we did see was a certain... A year ago, the third uh -huh, century. Mm -hmm. ...was an enormous plangency in what you had to say, and also the notion that everyone is thrown into the ocean at some time. The audience that crosses that empty space, the zillion dancers you had, each one who was touched at some point and spoke a truth. There was something deeply moving and sacred about that and about your uh, loneliness, your cries at that uh, end of the performance that I hope will stay in mind because I think um, that little Pip deserves to be remembered, even as a fictional character. He's a little boy who is alone and touched. Mm -hmm. And so are many of us. And some are drowned. Some ca can't cross that space. But all of us will try. And so in that sense, I felt that the performance that we saw already had a sacred quality that I'm looking forward to and anxious to, um, to walk with you. You know, I'll, I'll be holding your hand somehow when I see it, like I always do, which is why I come. And so you do. You know, when, in Fela, we used to quote him as saying, um, the music is um, drawing the gods down mm -hmm. and pulling them up mm -hmm. from the earth. And um, when we get it right, that's what we say, the god comes into the room. And that's when I said, you asked me, how does it end? And I said to you, well, let's see what the gods say, you know? And that's, uh, I know it sounds a little sentimental, romantic, but Actually, actually, I believe it. That is the indeterminacy that John Cage never acknowledged, but it is what I think he was going after, you know? Well, we can determine what's just before the end. Yes, that, yes, that part, we can. Sort of, sort of, because there's a hundred, there are a hundred people involved. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, just to, just to go back to that, uh, just f for a moment, that, that, you know, we didn't discuss, and, and maybe we should, not to dwell too much on Pip, but this sort of beauty of this, um, that, that scene that you reminded us of when uh, his body was bobbing, but his soul sank. Uh, the, the sea the, during the sea. kept his finite body yeah. up, but drowned the infinite of his soul. Right, and, and there's something, you know, whatever that moment is, um, which in the end uh, was, could be read as madness, you know, what resulted in madness, or what potentially resulted in some kind of understanding, you know, which Ahab, I think, in the end, there, there's this sort of um, sense that, that this boy, you know, um, is now, you know, some kind of um, spiritual thing, right? Because he knows something that nobody else knows. Mm -hmm. and, and so there, there's something like, really magical about that, that boundary between madness and knowledge and truth. That yeah. interests me a lot. I think that Pip is a child who enters that ship voluntarily, maybe uh, with economic reasons, right? But that's his second passage. He's already come over once through his ancestors mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. not voluntarily and not, I mean, he may have been a f uh, a f always been a free person but somebody in his background was not. So I like to think about um, how lost he must feel. How did I get here? And don't we all? So I'm, I'm hopeful that that, that little body um, gets remembered in, in this piece well, somehow. Well, let's say you hope that it gets remembered in the world. So that, well, you, yes, yeah. of course. Because all of the angry people out there, you've paid attention to our universities, you know what a microaggression is. You know what people want to have 
trigger warnings. They want you to know that I am a woman that's been abused. I want you to know this. I want you to know that. Do you care about them not drowning? I don't even know, other than to bear witness, I don't know how, how do you say this, Ellie? How do you heal the fucking world? How do you do that, right? That's a mandate in certain quarters, right? So I don't know. So I, I know what you feel about Pip, but how can you, that person, the next angry person who feels disenfranchised, how do you put your arms around them? I don't know. I do it one kid at a time. Yeah, I know. And you're good at it. You're very good at it. I don't know. I'm a self-involved artist. <laughs> I just want to get over, right? Um, nah, that isn't you. Well, I know. I know. I go, I'm maybe something else. Anyone else? One moment, please. I think it's probably already on, sir. Is this meant to be a mirror of our humanity that you're uh, exploring? Mm. with uh, maybe perhaps sound to tap into our uh, primal uh, notions about one another and about the moment that we're in and uh, exploring with uh, Pip? That's a very good question. Do you know that, uh, it's it, touching the way you ask it, do you know there's a story, I'm not even sure if it's apocryphal, supposedly, because I was just at the Frick two days ago and they asked me to write something about the collection, and I cannot, there was a Chardin still life. And I'm thinking that what I should write is a story, I'm going to say, and there's very versions of it, Peggy Guggenheim asked Calder to look at the work of this young artist, Jackson Pollock. And he sees this. Supposedly the conversation went, where are the people in this painting? You know this story? And supposedly Pollock or somebody says, we're the people in, those painting, in this painting. So you're asking me, what is this thing that I'm describing? And is it a mirror? In other words, is there something it's trying to teach or show? Yes and no. If it's beautiful enough, I don't think we even ask when something is enchanting enough and we are experiencing aesthetic arrest. I don't think we even ask, what is this supposed to be for? It, it, it's got to be an experience, and the closest I can get to it's got to be like a religious experience. Mm -hmm. And how do I implicate you in it? My angel used to say that she's interested in art, which was like, she mentioned a Mexican writer was a favorite of hers, that you, you, you think you're standing on the beach and you're looking at the ocean and the stars, and the next thing you know, because of the writing, you're up here in the water. Ah, right, right. Before you know it, you're in the water up to here. But you were just standing on the beach and looking at the sky. Well, isn't that wonderful? So, is, that, is this work supposed to be a reflection? I don't know. If we do our work really well, if we get that hoodoo just right, you're going to get your theater fix, you're going to get your aesthetics fix, and maybe you'll do this thing called catharsis. Experience of passion. Experience of passion. Yeah, yeah, yes. All of, the, all of the above. Anyone else? Yes, sir. The air, you're making a piece for one of the most beautiful cathedral-like spaces in the whole world. And uh, we've talked about the music bringing the gods down from heaven and Pip's infinite soul sinking way down to the depths. I'm betting you're going to be leaving the surface somehow. <laughs> you've, already, uh, you've already been thinking about that. We've been you? thinking about leaving the surface, but maybe not up, mm. maybe down. Um, but uh, it's, it is, you know, that, that space, you will appreciate the space, um, even though there's no acrobatics up in the air. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, but there's something about that surface, if, if the space were 30 feet high, it would feel very, very different. It's, a, you know, it's this, 
exceptional space that when you work the lights, you know, you just don't see the volume, you lose the volume, and and it's um, it's it's pretty extraordinary. So I think um, I think we're making you know use of the whole space. I think so. Um, I've asked the sound man to consider what it is. Can we now? He's so he's a genius. He's very intelligent. How can we at some point, and he said, I'll think about it, how can you give the feeling that the whole room goes up mm -hmm. with sound? Mm -hmm. wow. Well, stay tuned. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Was there somebody over here? Yeah. Raise your hand. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Hi, um, I'm curious to hear you speak more on um, your decision to cast the 100 dancers and um, what went into the casting process and what it means to present this universal experience of loneliness, but also knowing that everyone's identity carries a certain amount of social capital and to be born in America, to be an American citizen, to be in a white supremacist government and mm. carry certain inherit, inherited benefits. Is Kyle Maud in the room? I know. Kyle, would you, would you talk about how we've recruited our uh, 100 people, or how we are recruiting our yeah, 100 we people? Are presently re recruiting. We actually, Bill and Janet, selected 10 captains, nine, actually, I think we're using. And we're asking, and they're people from our world. So there's some BGJ alum dancers, there's some dancers who have performed here, there are dancers from other walks of Bill's life that he's met, lecturing at Yale, on Broadway, other places. Um, and so there's nine individuals who have been tasked with bringing in 10 people from their own community. And so each person is in the process of finding the 10 community members that they'll bring in. So we actually put the task on these 10 captains that Bill selected. I, I, I want to just, you know, it sort of touches on this issue, uh, but also the discourse around this project. Between, spe specifically, we've been arguing about one thing, and about, and uh, which you s mentioned early in the conversation, that while this piece sort of starts with Pip, it's about, you know, lots of disenfranchised people and communities of people. So, you know, 50% of the population um, are women, right? And we're part of that. And, um, you know, you talk about trans people, gay people, you know, there are just, there are many, um, um, you know, uh, uh, I mean, I would say uh, that probably there's a little bit of that in everyone. And that's sort of the, you know, the way to touch on the humanity question that, there's a sense of everyone's implicated in this. Maybe not everyone, even the ones that feel empowered, you know, and have no question about being a problem, um, also think about their role in that. And I think that, you know, the, the piece is ultimately about that. But where we've been sort of arguing is, do we have to bring up anyone else? Do we have to bring up any um, of the other disenfranchised folks? Because we start with Mar Martin Luther King, we touch on PIP, we touch on certain kind of references in black American history, um, and, um, and, and, and does it, does, is, it, is it ultimately, do we uh, diffuse the piece too much when we incorporate too many issues? Uh, can everyone relate through this one, sort of this PIP character, even though it's a black boy, um, can we relate? I feel that we can all relate, and and we don't need too many more references, and those. But we don't need to say that. We don't that, need to that's say that's your them. concern with there being too much language, and I, I hear what you're saying, and yeah. I've been trying to cut it back, but yeah, yeah, no, I think good. there's something about seeing those bodies on stage, according to yeah. you, Madame. Mm -hmm. I know my experience. I don't know why something came, uh, occurred to me when I was at my prime, and I would be on stage alone, sweating, and then I realized that their whole room were white people. 
and it, you know, I, and I thought, you know, Bill, there's something, you know, this is not just, this is not neutral. The, this situation is rife with, and I even would say, oh, when I'm on stage, I feel the slave block. A bit over the top, but not entirely wrong. So I, if, you, if what you're saying, those 100 people, let them out there, and let us really look at them, and the question is, look at them doing what? Already the point is being made. You're right. They're, the world showed up, right? Um, that is what I'm, that's what I'm doing. Can we do it with people who are all, let's say we did it with 125-year-old blondes. That should work. <laughs> they're, they're human beings, and human beings suggest all human beings, correct? Except you'd sort of, well, what, what about that? Let's say I did it with 125-year-old blondes. Would that be universal? What, why? Why not? In, that, in the, first, the first rehearsal that we had um, at the Armory, there were 100 dancers there, and you gave the mic to them, and they all had, you know, the, I don't know what, what... do you know? What do you know, right? I know that, and, and I don't know what... Um, I know what it's like to have a gun held to my head. But, but it had to be one sentence, right? Each of them had to say something. Well, that was one sentence or something personal, right? And it was amazing, you know? It was amazing hearing all of those statements from all of those folks with different accents that all look different. They didn't all look like dancers. Um, it was it was it was really really beautiful and touching and very you know and I hope we can maintain that. I hope we can get that mix again. That, that mix again, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But you know, I was just you know thinking. I mean, this is you know maybe just so obvious, but if this piece were made four years ago, it wouldn't have meant as much as now. And the issue of you know re referencing this piece of literature and Pip somehow in our particular moment historically right now, where we realize how little, you know, of the efforts of civil rights have gone, you know, that, you know, that it's so easy to go backwards. It's um, that there's something incredibly resonant in this for all of us, and I think that's why it's, um, it's an important piece. You Did know? you ever and see Meredith Monk's Quarry? Quarry? Quarry was the uh, defining work of the 70s, and a lot of it, the Quarry, I think, was actually the film, where she had a huge group of people. I don't remember what the racial breakdown, I imagine they were kind of countercultural people. There might have been a couple of blacks, all in white, in a rock quarry doing things, right? So it isn't unprecedented to be trying to do, do this. And I, I know that, and I think there's something about those people being able to have give to, to have voice. Yeah. I, I think that, is, that makes the, the difference. But, but I, I just think that the uh, issues of race have never, you know, for a long time, we were assuming that, that progress, so much progress has been made until Trump, right? And, you know, it's not a coincidence, really, that um, this piece comes in a post-Trump moment and that even though we don't recognize any of that and we don't have to refer to any of that, but um, it's, it's a resonant moment in time where this piece is going to have much more, you know, uh, a, a stronger, um, I think, uh, you know, it's gonna hit people in a stronger way than had we done it four years ago. Well, I, I, I think I know what you're getting at, but I think for some of us, <laughs> seeing what the world was like when Mr. Obama was elected. Why were people crying? Jesse Jackson's crying, Oprah's crying, I'm crying, other people are crying. What did it mean to go through the South and see effigies of him hung? And let's go even back further than that. You know, all those Civil War memorials and all, many of them were put up in response to Martin Luther King, that Civil Rights Act of 1964, out of which, so it depends on where you've been standing. Some of us feel like we've grown up in a battle zone. 
And I'm saying some of us grew up with the feeling that we were somehow or other problematic. So um, that is not, I don't think four years, yes, the Michael Brown lying in the street in Ferguson came at a very particular time, but what about Emmett Till? You know, what about, uh, you know, do, do we need to get out the litany of people? So I don't even know if that is the point. This, there's something about the piece that I think might escape its topicality because it represents this gesture to do the one and the many. The one and the many as a metaphor. I know I've been interested in it my whole life. But remember, you know, we, because we don't know whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending or a pensive ending, um, that one in many is one in a community or one in a crowd, anonymous crowd, right? And so we don't yet know what that, you know, what all of that <laughs> ends up in. Uh, it's, it's sort of a dot, 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 you know. You, you said something very, um, very strong to me when we had a meeting here, we came back together and, and you said that my concern, Bill, is that you have earned, or we have earned something with you alone, with the fragility of this empty space, and that we will, if we are overly putting too many stories in, too, I don't know if you said too many bodies, but I do think each body is a story, right? To, that we will, first of all, lose the audience's engagement, but we will also erase something that's very, very important and fragile. I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking about that. I'm willing to risk it, because I think that that gesture, that, uh, how do, should we call it, that Baroque gesture of so many people and lots of activities, um, I think it could be worth it in this era. How do we describe or suggest the fractious dialogue of our time? How do we suggest the babble that we live in? And suggest is the word, yeah. Uh, yes, please, please. Hello. Hi. Um, so on perhaps a more meta level, um, I'm curious about the experience of sharing with the public something that hasn't yet come out. Um, I'm a college student and I'm studying architecture, so both in the world of performance art or, or live arts and architecture too, how much or how common is it to have sort of a public facing dialogue about a project that hasn't yet been released? We were concerned about it as well. And what, what does that mean to you and how, how are you thinking about what to share one, and, and in the infrastructure world too? Did you have any anxiety about this talk tonight? No, not really, because we've done a couple of talks and we will do a couple more. I think the process, you know, one of the things that um, is very different for architects, right, um, and for people in theater, dance, is just, is just the way we do things, is the way we make and create things. And um, I've, you know, it was really interesting being part of the way that this piece was created. It's kind of in rehearsal. You know, so there's time between rehearsals where everybody's thinking and, you know, exchanging some things and then we come together and then s we start to work and the piece transforms. And Bill is always working with his, with his dancers and they're continuing things. So when we come back to another rehearsal and we say, what happened? You know, where's that piece? It doesn't make sense anymore or whatever. Um, it's, it's, it's a it's a really interesting process to be part of it. You know, in architecture, we're always sort of following a thread and it's always very linear and, you know, people weave in and out. And, you know, there, there are things that are different and, and similar, but it's been really interesting to see how you work with your dancers. And the piece is constantly evolving and it, it feels very comfortable to talk about the evolution, even the sort of bumps and disagreements, and you know, it's going to come out. Whatever we say, it's probably going to look different <laughs> when we when we get to the stage. Um, uh, and I think that you know, it's um, it feels fine. There'll be the you know, we're we're not divulging everything, no, but we're no, also no, in, we, pro we in process. We couldn't because performance is its own thing. However, for instance, what do you think of the work of Christo? You know Christo. 
Right. Well, a good part of Christo's work was, in fact, how it got made. And literally, documentaries are made about going and applying for the permit to do this and soliciting people to do that and all. That is a, a, a trope of, I dare say, the 70s maybe, 70s, 80s, process art. And I think that everything is fair game to be talked about. And you can frame it. Uh, if, if Liz and I did it tonight in clown costumes, right, like Bruce Nauman, we, this discussion, we're doing, doing clown costumes. Then, and we give it a name, right, right? The conversation, Deep Blue Sea. Would that be different? I think in my mind, it's already part of a performance. It's already part of something. And you, we are all privileged to do this unique performance tonight. That's my feeling about talking about work as you're doing it. Yeah, yeah. and I think that, you know, just on that meta level, that working out things between us, you know, and what marginalization means, because, you know, the first response is, I'm, you know, Hey, me too, you know, <laughs> you know, in many ways. But, um, what do you mean, though? What well, you no, I mean that, you know, the piece is, you know, starts with a sort of uh, black framework, but, you know, hey, I've, you know, I've had a very difficult, my, my family, you know, I've survived, some of them survived the Holocaust. And, and so, you know, I have a story too, and we have really difficult, you know, some of us have very difficult pasts and presence and so, you know, we're working things out also about, you know, what does the peace mean for either of us and can I ever understand you, mm. right? I mean, you know, can you ever understand me? So anyway, it is, you know, I, I, I think there, it is, you know, what Bill is saying that we're like just working as part of the project. And you know, yeah. I, I understand. The I, I understand, I, like I say, I'm a self-involved artist maker, right? The we becomes more and more difficult every day, every year. So I know that you and I have had difficult lives, but what is the consciousness of we? The American people feel, you know, do you believe that bullshit, right? Who can tell me what the American people really feel? And how can I get that communion? Ah, there's the word. How can you make something that provides an opportunity for this very problematic term, communion? That's what it is, communion. That's what I would like it to be. Yes, my, my companion is giving me a signal. Did you have one thing, sir, you want to say? Thanks so much for this talk, thank you. I wanted to ask this question in terms of your process and thinking, in terms of image or narrative or representations or abstraction, in terms of visually giving some direction. Is it abstract, is it movement, does it have narrative? And the same for you, Liz. When you think of the space, are you thinking, because you're dealing with literature of the incredible images that are described, that you read, are you thinking in terms of narrative, in terms of light or space? Just curious how your mind thinks of image along the track of abstraction, movement, body, or literary things, or images like cinema or painting. Anything you could share with us on that? Well, I certainly do. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, someone, I once read this somewhere, and people, and I, said it to architects, I said, isn't it true that you can judge a building, a, a good building should tell you how to enter it? Mm. A good building should tell you where the, where the front is and so on and how you behave in it, right? And you don't have to know very much about the architect's int intention, the building will tell you, right? Now, I'm trying to get at the answer to your question, uh, to, your, to your question, but I keep thinking, let's make a language and the language is repeated, and then when you hear the first few notes of a beautiful piece of music, and then 45 minutes later the piece is concluding, I bet you couldn't tell me everywhere it went, but you can feel what it was. That's how I use gesture, that's how I use repetition, 
That's how I use space. And that, I believe, is what connects me to architecture in that way. No, this is not programmatic. It sometimes tantalizes you as if it is telling you a little story, but it's not really. You will be the story. Yeah. Thank you very much, well, everybody. Just, Thank you. Oh, I just, oh, oh, I just oh, want to. I just want to say just one thing on the. You know, just because I'm. It's a really good, a provocative question. Um, that balance between having a reference and a literary reference which could be a metaphor, right, for something broader, which to be successful has to be entirely absorbed and no longer seen as a metaphor, right? That is, well, you, you know, to, to, for a metaphor, like let's say Pip, you know, that, that, that's that reference, we start with a literary a reference, but we're alluding to something bigger and broader and having this mode of content that is also very contemporary, the metaphor has to be absorbed. It can't continue to be a metaphor. And so when we, you know, sort of make that reference a second time, a third time, a fourth time, you know, there's something that happens with the repetition as well. I think that we're on this tightrope of balancing between this um, sort of sort of serious heavy content, but the ability of dance and gesture to do, how much can it do? How much do um, other sort of means that we have? Um, which is, we're not reading the book anymore, we're you know, maybe um, using a quote or a word, um, and you know, physically in space. What can we do physically in space? I think for us, for the sort of um, we're, we're very dependent on sound, um, not only the composed score, but just the ambience of the sound, um, we're, and, and being able to spatialize it, right? And also the ability of light to not only, you know, put a slide, spotlight on a performer, but to change the sort of feel of a space, the general feel of a space. Sometimes you don't even know that it's, that it's happening. But it's, it's a kind of vocabulary that we have built into the project that is very, very narrow. We're not allowing a lot of tricks that we could be using. We're just using the, you know, the projectors and lights to do everything in terms of... Um, and it's not a story. It doesn't have a beginning and a middle and an end. Well, but it. There are multiple stories that we've, and we, we've, always, we've used this sort of structure of a weave, you know, rather than other sort of um, strategies, right? So that there are multiple strands that move in different directions that keep, that you, that you recognize all the way through. And I think that's sort of, um, you know, it's a, it's a very spare, it's very sparely done. I think we'll, if we're successful, we'll be successful through its spareness and not trying to do everything, not trying to tell every story and not trying to use every trick in the book. That's what I call rigor. Yeah. yeah. Rigor. We should stop. I'm sure your butts are getting tired. <laughs>